Today's message is entitled, The Economy of the Kingdom. It is different than the economy of the United States and other worldly kingdoms. In the United States, $2 is worth more than $1. $1,000 is a lot more value than $1. And then $10,000 has even more value than a dollar. And that's how we kind of look at the economy is in value of things. Uh, and for those economists, they also recognize that um, the value of a dollar is worth less now than it was 20, 30 years ago. There's less buying power. But the economy of the kingdom is different. Jesus, since he uh, went to Jerusalem for that final Passover celebration, which so many people call the triumphal entry, would spend each day teaching and observing in the temple court area, and then would retire each evening to Bethany. And we see him again in the temple court area and taking a look at Mark chapter 12, starting with verse 41, it says this, and he sat down opposite the treasury and began observing how the people were putting money into the treasury. And many rich people were putting large sums. Now, we read this and we kind of used to our own practices. And in our own practice, uh, the offering plate is put passed by and people drop in money. And a lot of times what we have is uh, we have a little envelope so you can put your check or put your uh, cash in, and no one necessarily knows how much you're giving, and, and that's a good thing. And then there are others who will make people come by and place the offering in front and, and, and go, and it's obvious that who gives and who doesn't. And then there are others who practice uh, putting the offering in a table uh, before you come in, so you drop in your offering there. In this instance, what happened was that the treasury, the offering, was probably taking place in the court of the women. There was the court of the Gentiles, the court of the women, court of the men, and then on into the more uh, areas of the temple complex. And so the collection was not by taking offering plates and passing them around. There was these large um, metal, probably brass, uh, collection places, and since they didn't have paper money like we did, people placed in coins, and it would be obvious how much you were placing in, or at least the number of coins, because as you put it in, it would clank and sound and whatever, and, and if you wanted to be real cute, you would get your money converted to the lowest number of coins, so it sounded like you were putting in a whole lot of money. Um, and that would impress people because uh, you were clanking in. And the closest thing I can uh, have for you to is if you've ever gone to a bank where there's a coin machine and you dump the coins in the machine, it makes a lot of noise as it's separating and whatever. That's kind of what's happening in the temple. There's all this noise going on as people are pouring their coins into it. And so Jesus is observing all of this, and he's talking about that there are many uh, rich people who are putting in large sums of money. It says, verse 42, a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which amount to a cent. So it's the least denomination of that. It's probably about one thirty-second of a denarii, which would be about 15 minutes of work. So it's very little money. And she places it. And we don't know her name. We just know her status. She's a poor widow. And she puts in two copper coins. In our culture, the least expensive, the, the, the cheapest monetary value is a copper coin. As Lincoln's head on it. And on the back it has... The Lincoln Memorial. Now, during World War II, it wasn't made out of copper. 
for those of you who are history buffs. For a couple of years, the penny was made out of steel because with the war effort, copper was needed for other things. But we now uh, have gone back to the penny being copper. So we kind of can understand that this is the bare minimum uh, monetary value of the time. So she places these two copper coins, which amount to a cent. So when you hear all the other clanging of the other offerings, you would, this would barely even be noticeable. But notice what Jesus does. He says, calling his disciples to him, he said to them, truly I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all the contributors to the treasury. Now, I want you to notice something. He didn't say she put in the same amount as everybody else, that she didn't equal those who had been giving large sums of money. Jesus said, when you take all the offering today and you total it up, this widow gave more than everyone else combined. Now, you and I would say, I don't know, Jesus, you know, it, there's not much you can do with, two, with a cent. There's a whole lot of money you can do, you, things you can do with thousands of dollars and tens of thousands of dollars. But Jesus says, we're not talking about that economy. We're talking about the economy of the kingdom. And in the economy of the kingdom, these two copper coins are worth more than all the contribution that day. But Jesus will tell us why. For they all put in out of their surplus, but she out of her poverty put in all that she owned, all she had to live on. Jesus says that what makes her gift sizable is that she gave it not out of surplus, but out of poverty. She didn't give it out of what she could leave extra, but she gave it all. We're never told what this woman's name is. But this gift is recorded to remind us that the economy of the kingdom is different than our economy that God is praising this person because she gave all that she had rather than from her surplus. Now, to a great extent, this makes us all on equal footing. For you see, I mean, by, except for some strange miracle that I can't perceive, I'll never have this amount of money that uh, the people that own Microsoft have or the people who own Amazon or the people that own various tech companies. They have billions of dollars. And yet under the economy of the kingdom, I can give more than them. And you can give more than them because you give out of not what you have extra, but all that you have. Before I go on and com com comment more, I want you to also notice what it isn't said, that there are so many times that you will hear TV evangelists and others who will say that you ought to give to God to get. That if you simply give to God, that he will give you in return. Notice we never see that Jesus said, let's go give her some money or let's take her out of poverty. He praises her, but he does not necessarily change her life because she gave everything to him because she loved God that much. So I want to take a few other things besides money because they always say that the pastors love to talk about money, and that's, I'm talking about the economy. So I'm not saying write big checks. I'm saying consider what it is that you have versus what it is that you give. So I want to take a few things. First, passion. 
Do you give all of your passion to God? Or do you give it to sporting events? I say that because I like sports. I like, and I get all nervous when my team is behind, and I get all excited when they go ahead, and, and I'm very ecstatic when they win, and I'm, I don't want to hear the news when they lose. And, and so it's, it's an emotional aspect. But I would certainly hope that my passion is greater for God than for sports. Do I give all that I have that's my passion about him or do I keep it? What about talents? What about your ability to play music or to sing or to, or to draw or perform art or dance or whatever your talent might be? Again, the economy of the kingdom places us, if you will, equal. Or you see, I cannot sing like Pavarotti. But if I sing to God all that I am and all that I have, then my praise to God can be greater than Pavarotti's. Some of you don't know who that guy is. So Katy Perry, most of you know her. She sings reasonably well. A little eccentric, but whatever. God doesn't say, that person sings well, and that person doesn't. So that person sits down, and we let that person sing. When you use your talents for God, God then says, are you using it all? Or are you keeping back us a little bit? And to me, one of the sad things about the church is so many people who are famous in the secular music world today got their start in church. To me, that's sad. Glad that we get to hear the benefit of their music and their talents. But wouldn't it have been much greater if while they were out doing the world's things, they were on Sundays singing in a church choir or a band or whatever, giving their talent to God. So in the economy of the kingdom, there are no excuses. I only have this much. There's a song that says, if just a cup of water is all I've given, then just a cup of water is all that is required. In the economy, it's not how great, how talented, how wealthy you are. It's your commitment to God and his kingdom. This woman's gift, given almost 2,000 years ago, still speaks of her dedication to God that she was willing to give even in her poverty. But in reality, and again, I'm pointing three fingers back at me, how we seem to be so reluctant to give out of our riches. Jesus is going to further talk about the economy of the kingdom. And if you'll turn in your Bibles to John chapter 12, starting with verse 30, or 20, I'm sorry, 20. Now there were some Greeks among those who were going up to the worship at the feast. These then came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and began to ask him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. So these Greeks are probably God-fearers. They're probably not Jews. They are Gentiles, but they are God-fearers, which means that they've kind of adopted the religion of the Jews, but yet worship God. And they came to Jerusalem 
as the Jews did in celebration of Passover. And whether they had heard about Jesus before they got there, I'm sure the talk of the town of Jerusalem is Jesus and what's happening and what's he's teaching and how the religious leaders are upset with him and what's going to happen. And so whether they heard about Jesus before or after, they want to talk to him. They want to see him. And so they make their introduce, introduction to Philip. Now, probably the reason that they go to Philip is Philip's name is Greek. So they think, well, he's probably sympathetic to their position. So they approach Philip. Now, Philip, it says, it says so Philip came and told Andrew. So I'm sure he's not saying, well, what should I do? Should I make the introduction to the Greeks or not? I know Jesus has said that he has come to the lost tribe of Israel and, then he, and he hasn't been all that um, sympathetic to non-Jews, although he has heals and he has done some things. So should we make these introductions or not? So I think he's getting advice from Andrew what we should do. So Andrew, being Andrew, because uh, Andrew's always one who kind of introduces people to Jesus, kind of seems to say, okay. And so... Uh, they came and told Jesus, and Jesus answered them saying, now it's interesting what Jesus is going to say. He says this, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. What he tells the Greeks is the same thing that he's told the Jews, it is the same thing that he's told the Samaritans, it is the same thing that he's told the Syrophoenician woman. It is consistent that he is saying he came to be a suffering servant and he came to, be glor to glorify the Son of Man and that hour has come. It's interesting, the hour of his glorification is his crucifixion. Most of us would think that that's the worst thing that could happen. But he's saying, that is the hour of glorification, my crucifixion. And he's going to say why, because he says that if a grain doesn't fall to the ground and die, it's basically worth it. It just stays what it is. But if it dies and is buried, then it produces fruit. So he, he's trying to explain to this agricultural community that that's what happens when wheat or what other seed might happen, that when it is buried and produces, it produces 10, 20, 100 fold. And Jesus is saying that his death and burial is necessary for that production of fruit. Let me give you a little secret. His death and burial has been so fruitful that those of you who believe in him, believe in him because of that fruit. Almost 2,000 years. There were those, his disciples, after seeing his death, burial, and resurrection, truly believed who he was. There were those who were attached to the, the apostles who came to faith. There were those on the feast of, of uh, went out of my head, out of the feast of Pentecost, where thousands became believers. And then another message, more thousands became believers. And through the centuries, the church has grown, the kingdom has grown, because that Jesus died and was buried and rose again, he produced fruit. And the amazing thing is, he will continue to bear fruit even today. There will be those who come to faith in him because of his death and burial and resurrection. And even when we think this world has gone to hell in a handbasket, there still will be those who come to faith because of him. He has produced much fruit. And on top of that, not only, not only has he produced believers, 
But because he's produced believers, he's produced the fruit of the Spirit within our lives. That as it increases of love and faith and patience and kindness and endurance and all the other fruits of the Spirit, they'll continue to grow in the believer. But then he makes it personal. He's talked about him, but he talks now about our response. Verse 25, he says, He who loves his life loses it. Jesus is saying, if you love your life, the result will be you'll lose it. You'll have, see people who will eat well. They'll eat the correct diet. They'll exercise. They'll do all the things that they can do to live longer. And that might be. I tend to believe that you don't live any longer doing those things. I think you live better. I mean, let's face it. If you're sickly and in bed and you live years and years, it's nearly not as much fun as if you live and you're out doing things and, and accomplishing things and, and doing exciting things. But, but I tend to think you don't necessarily live longer. Um, as I would say, 100% of the people who ate, eat kale will die. I choose kale because I'm allergic to it. In the recorded biblical history, only two people have not died. And guess what, friends? They ain't with us. You cannot keep that what you cannot keep. Your life has been given to you as a gift of God. And if you choose to love it, you cannot keep it. But he says this, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it, but he doesn't stop there, to eternal life. Now, in our culture, hate is a very strong word. We kind of think of malice and those types of things. What Jesus is talking about, when you have a choice between one thing and the other, when you choose the other, that's what you love and that's what you hate. Jesus is saying, when you have the choice between choosing your life or something else, then you hate your life. So when you choose God over your life, you love God more than your life. When you choose your children over yourself, you love your children and hate yourself. The scripture says, for instance, Esau, he hated Jacob, he loved. You've said it the other way. Jacob, I love, but Esau, I hate it. Didn't mean that he wanted the ill will of Esau. It meant that when it came to blessings, it always preference to Jacob. So he's saying, in the economy of the kingdom, Trying to hold on to this life causes you to lose it. But surrendering this life, you will gain eternal life. If anyone serves me, he has the option of following me. It's not what it says. It says he must follow me. It is not an option to follow Jesus if you serve him. And where I am, there my servant will be also. Jesus, during his ministry, would frequently say, what I see the Father doing, that is what I do. And in essence, we as his servants are supposed to be aware enough to say, 
When we see Jesus doing something, that's where we're to be. That's where we're to serve. That's where we're to do what he does. So Jesus, in his teachings, will say things like, when I was in prison, you visited me. And when I was naked, you clothed me. When I was hungry, you fed me. And when I was thirsty, you gave me water. And the people said, well, when did we see you in all of these things? And he said, when you saw the least of these, you served me. We do what Jesus does. We follow his example, and we serve because that's why he came. I can think of no better way to show loving your life versus hating your life as to taking your life a step down and say, your life is more important. Your needs are more important. I will serve you. And if Jesus the King of kings and Lord of lords, can serve us. And we're going to see in a few weeks who literally would get on his hands and knees and wash the feet of his disciples. How can we say we follow him if we don't do what he does? Again, we have this idea that if we have this big ministry that somehow God will be impressed or that I have all this money and we give all this money that somehow God will be impressed. And as Jesus has said, when you give out of your surplus, okay. But when you give out of all that you have and all that you are, Notice what happens. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. In the years that I have had the privilege of being your pastor and of serving, there have been some really good days and there have been some really bad days. And there have been some times when people have been very encouraging in my ministry and there have been some days when Pretty much people thought, maybe you should, maybe you're not even saved, you know. It's been tough. And while in the human aspect it is nice when people appreciate what you do, that's not why you serve. That's not why you do. Because the opinions of men change very rapidly. Ask Jesus. He comes in one day. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And a few days later, crucify him, crucify him. We have no king but Caesar. So if you're ever hoping to win a popularity contest, it'll be short. But when God honors you, it is eternal. And I can think nothing better than to hear the words of honor. Well done, you good and faithful slave. And a cherry on the top. You gave all that you had. Even out of your poverty. Because you love me that much. That my ministry was more important in your life. My ministry was more important than your worth. My ministry is more important than your self-worth or the worth of others. So while I do not believe that the kingdom of heaven is a great communist state in the sky, I do believe this, that every single person who enters into the kingdom has the same ability to give all. Whether it's two copper coins or the wealth of the world. A 
Again, the world will look at the large gifts and will praise the givers. The people who have talent of musicians and singing will talk about how wonderful that person is, and they'll put them in the center stage and give them all this glory and honor. The person in the back who can barely carry a pitch, if they give all that they have, God will reward. The person who decides, maybe I won't use my talent on the stage. I'll use my talent making the pastor look better on the camera. Or maybe I'll use my talent so that the band plays and people can hear it and hear it better than maybe they sing. And, and the people who do the words, so we have the ability to know what the songs are, because for some reason, even though we may have sung it last week, we don't remember it this week. So there are people who are using their gifts so that it might make it easier for all of us to worship the Lord. And yeah, because you sit in the back, you may not feel noticed. But in the economy of the kingdom, giving all that you have will cause him to honor you. But if you're not in the kingdom, it doesn't matter. If you are not a fruit as a result of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, then you can win by having all the toys and all the things. And you can be a philanthropist and give away billions of dollars. You simply end up like that rich man who had it all. The Lazarus, who had nothing, was a beggar, was in paradise. I encourage you to examine our lives, to determine, are we following him? Truly following him. Not what some person, but what his word says. And by following him doesn't mean we just read the word. It means we do the word. And that that fruit that he produced by his death, burial, and resurrection has been emplaced in us so that we, upon our death and burial, will be resurrected. I would still rather be the poorest person in heaven than the richest man in hell. But it is his grace, his mercy, his faithfulness that causes us to be there. His death 2,000 years ago is still producing fruit. And all God's people said, 